afternoon and welcome to the John Wilmerding Symposium on American Art, Afro-Atlantic Histories. I'm E. Carmen Ramos, Chief Curatorial and Conservation Officer at the National Gallery of Art. Held in conjunction with the Afro-Atlantic Histories exhibition, the Wilmerding Symposium has gathered literary and visual artists to reflect on how art responds and shapes both official and overlooked narratives wrought by the transatlantic slave trade and its legacies. The U.S. tour of the exhibition was curated by Kenitra Fletcher, Associate Curator of African American and Afro Diasporic Art, Molly Donovan, Curator of Contemporary Art, and Stephen Nelson, Dean of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, served on the exhibition's curatorial team. The symposium, or this symposium, was made possible by a grant from the Alice L. Walton Foundation. This is the final session named in honor of Clint Smith's statement in his 2021 book, How the Word is Passed, a Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. He stated, Black is not peripheral to the American project. It is a foundation upon which the country was built, end quote. I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished panel of visual and literary artists. Clint Smith is the author of the narrative nonfiction book, How the World is Past, a Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America, which was a number one New York Times bestseller and winner of numerous awards, including the 2021 National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction and the 2002 Stowe Prize. The book was selected by the New York Times as one of the 10 best books of 2021. He is also the author of the poetry collection, Counting Descent, which won the 2017 Literary Award for Best Poetry Book from the Black Caucus of the American Liter Library Association and was a finalist for an NAACP Image Award. Smith earned his BA in English from Davidson College and a PhD in education from ha Harvard University. His essays, poems, and short uh, and scholarly writing have appeared um, have been published in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, The New Republic, Poetry Magazine, and elsewhere. Previously, Smith taught high school English in Prince George's County here in Mar or near in Maryland. He currently teaches writing and literature in DC's Central Detention Facility. Smith is also host of the YouTube series, Crash Course in Black American History. Originally from Pittsburgh, Renee Stout earned her BFA in painting from Carnegie Mellon University. When she moved to Washington, D.C. in 1985, she began to explore her African-American heritage through a variety of media, including painting, drawing, mixed media sculpture, photography, and installation. Stout became the first American artist to exhibit in the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. Her work encourages self-examination, reflection, and levity, pulling from current events and everyday life. Stout is a recipient of the Women's Caucus for Art Lifetime Achievement Award, the Janet and, and Walter Sodham uh, Artscape Prize, the David C. Driscoll Prize, the Joan Mitchell Award, the Pollock Krasner Foundation Award, the Anonymous Was a Woman Award, and the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award. Her wood and mixed media sculpture headstone for Marie Laveau is on view in Afro-Atlantic histories. Hank Willis Thomas is an artist and co-founder for Four Freedoms. He was born in New Jersey to musician and physicist Hank Thomas, an artist, photographer, and renowned historian, curator, and scholar, Deborah Willis. He earned his BFA from New York University and an MA and MFA from the California College of Arts and has received honorary doctorates from the Maryland Institute of Art and the Institute of Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts in Portland, Maine. Thomas is a conceptual artist focusing on themes relating to perspective, identity, commodity, media, and popular culture. A trained photographer over the past several years, Thomas's practice has evolved to incorporate a variety of media, including mirrors and retro reflective vinyl to challenge perspectives of his work exploring 20th century protest images and often overlooked historical narratives. Influenced by social history and the hard fought perennial battle for equality in all areas of his work, 
Thomas co-founded Four Freedoms with artist Eric Gottsman in 2016 as a platform for civic engagement in the United States. His work titled A Place to Call Home, Africa, America, Reflection, is in the Gall National Gallery's collection and is on view in Afro-Atlantic histories. So for this afternoon, each of our speakers will offer a short presentation about their work, and then I'll pose a few questions. They'll speak in this order, Clint Smith, Renee Stout, and Hank Willis-Thomas. I now invite Clint to the virtual stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen, for, for that introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be here in, in the company of Hank and Renee, um, and I can't wait for their presentations, um, especially from, from two artists whose work I admire so much. The origin story of how the word is passed is that in 2017, I was watching several Confederate statues come down in my hometown in New Orleans, statues of PGD Beauregard, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee. And I was watching these statues come down and I was thinking about what it meant that I grew up in a majority black city in which there were more homages to enslavers than there were to enslaved people. And what are the implications of that? What does it mean that to get to school, I had to go down Robert E. Lee Boulevard? To get to the grocery store, I had to go down Jefferson Davis Parkway. That my middle school was named after a leader of the Confederacy. That my parents still live on a street today named after someone who owned over 150 enslaved people. Because the thing is, we know that symbols and names and iconography aren't just symbols. They are reflective of the stories that people tell. And those stories shape the narratives that communities carry. And those narratives shape public policy. And public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives. And that's not to say that taking down a 60-foot tall statue of Robert E. Lee is going to suddenly erase the racial wealth gap. But it does help us recognize the ecosystem of ideas and the ecosystem of stories and narratives that have shaped America. American history, and that ultimately give us a better understanding of the way that certain communities have been, di have been disproportionately and intentionally harmed throughout the course of American history. And so I was around looking around my city, and I was thinking about how New Orleans was once the largest and busiest slave market in the country at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And I was thinking about how my own education taught me about slavery in no way that was commensurate with the actual impact that it had on the legacy of my city, on my state, on my country. And so I started looking around and I tried to get a sense, well, who are the people who are telling this story and who are the people who are failing to? What are the places that are telling this story and what are the places that are failing to? Um, and, you know, it's as my, my old professor, uh, Walter Johnson, an incredible historian who wrote the book Soul by Soul, he says of New Orleans, the entire city is a memorial to slavery. It's in the roads enslaved people paved. It's in the levees enslaved people constructed. It's in the buildings enslaved people were sold out of. It's in the soil enslaved people are buried in. And so I started looking around and tried to get a better sense of, well, how, how are we talking about this or failing to talk about it? And I sort of broadened it out to different places across the country, even beyond New Orleans. And one of the first places I go was Monticello. Monticello Plantation is uh, will be familiar to many of you because it is the home of Thomas Jefferson, one of our uh, founding fathers, the third president of the United States. And I go to Monticello in part because I think that Jefferson is, uh, it sort of embodies some of the cognitive dissonance of the American experiment, which is to say that America is a place that has provided unparalleled opportunities uh, for wealth accumulation and upward mobility for millions of people across generations in ways that their ancestors could have never imagined. And it has also done so at the direct expense of millions and millions of other people who have been intergenerationally subjugated and oppressed. And both of those things are the story of America. It's not one over here and one over there. It's that they're both deeply entangled and reliant upon one another. And so when I go to, when I think about Jefferson, I think again that he sort of uh, embodies that, uh, that those contradictions. He is someone who wrote one of the most important documents in the history of the Western world, and also is someone who enslaved over 600 people over the course of his lifetime, including four of his own children. He is someone who wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all, all men are created equal, and wrote in notes on the state of Virginia that black people are inferior to whites in both endowments of body and mind. And so when I go to Monticello, part of what I'm trying to understand is how is this institution telling the story of who this man was? And are we being honest and telling a complex, robust, uh, three-dimensional story of who he was? Or are we telling sort of two-dimensional caricature that contributed to a sort of overly mythologized notion of who he was without struggling with or wrestling with the sort of less savory parts of his legacy. Uh, another place that I go is Angola prison. 
Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the country. It's in Louisiana, 18,000 acres wide, bigger than the island of Manhattan. It's a place where 75% of the people held there are black men and 70% are serving life sentences. And it is built on top of a former plantation. And what I tell folks is that if you were to go to Germany and you had the largest maximum security prison in Germany, and it was built on top of a former concentration camp in which the people held there were disproportionately Jewish, that place would quite rightfully be a global emblem of anti-Semitism. It will be abhorrent. It will be disgusting. We would never allow a place like that to exist because it would so clearly run counter to all of our moral and ethical sensibilities. And yet here in the United States, we have the largest maximum security prison in the country where the vast majority of the people are black men serving life sentences, work in fields, picking cotton, picking crops in, uh, in the same fields that their ancestors may have once been enslaved in. Uh, and while being washed over on horseback uh, by someone with a gun over their shoulder. So part of what I'm trying to understand when I go to Angola, are what are the ways that a history of white supremacy not only enacts physical violence against people's bodies, but also collectively numbs us to certain types of violence that in another global context would clearly be unacceptable. And what does it mean also that that place has a gift shop, right? The largest maximum security prison in the country has a gift shop at its front gate. And in the gift shop, you can buy coffee mugs and shot glasses and uh, and t-shirts and sweatshirts and hoodies and baseball caps and stuffed animals dressed in prison garb. And you can buy a coffee mug that has the silhouette of a watchtower. And above and below the watchtower reads Angola, a gated community, as if to make a mockery of or, or seemingly belittle the experiences of the thousands of people, the tens of thousands of people across many decades who have been held and incarcerated there, many people who died on that land. And one of the people that I went to Angola with was a guy named Norris Henderson. And Norris is someone who was incarcerated in Angola for almost 30 years. Uh, and now he's, since he's been released, he's been incredibly uh, active in the, the prison reform movement in New Orleans and, and Louisiana, uh, really across the country. And as we're leaving the this tour that we're on, in the distance, we see the silhouette of these men who are working in the fields while someone watches over them on horseback. And they're lifting their garden hose into the air and digging them into the earth, lifting their shovels into the air and digging them into the earth, lifting their spades into the air and digging them into the earth. And Norris looks at the men, he looks at me and he opens his hands and his hands have these calluses on them. From all these years he spent working in the fields and he's like, Clint, I can't explain to you what it felt like to work for seven cents an hour picking cotton in fields that I sometimes wondered if my own ancestors had picked cotton in up to 150, 200 years ago. And so for the people who are incarcerated in Angola, the people who have been incarcerated in Angola, this history is not an abstraction. It is not uh, a metaphor. It is, they feel it in their bodies. It is visceral, right? It says the scholar Cydia Hartman puts it, she talks about the afterlife of slavery how the remnants of slavery continue to shape our social, political, and economic infrastructure, and perhaps most directly uh, and most evidently in terms of the landscape, our carceral infrastructure. Uh, and then, you know, I go to several other places across the country, including uh, Confederate cemetery and spend the day with sons of Confederate veterans. I go to Galveston and spend time with the descendants of those who founded Juneteenth. I go to uh, New York City to try to disabuse people of the idea that slavery is only something that existed in the South. Um, I go to the Whitney Plantation, which is one of the only plantations in the country that centers the experiences of people who uh, were enslaved rather than being a place that has weddings and ceremonies and, and big dinners and fancy, fancy programming, um, but instead recognizes that a plantation is an intergenerational site of torture and exploitation. And when we provide a museum experience for it, we can only understand it as such. And I go to all these places and I end the book with my grandparents. Um, and I'm walking through the National Museum of African American History and Culture with my grandparents. And my grandfather was born in 1930 Jim Crow, Mississippi. And my grandmother born in 1930 Jim Crow, Florida, uh, 1939 Jim Crow, Florida. And I'm walking through them, through this museum with them. And, and I recognize that so much of the history that is documented in this museum are things that they experience firsthand. And so much of the violence that is documented in this museum are things that they experience firsthand. And when my, I asked my grandmother about it after she had this refrain, she kept saying, I lived it. I lived it. I lived it. And I thought about the woman who opened the National Museum of African American History and Culture, a woman named Ruth Bonner in 2016, who opened this museum alongside the Obama family. And I think about how she was the daughter of an enslaved person 
not the granddaughter, not the great granddaughter, the woman who opened the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016, who rang the bell to signal the opening of this museum, was the daughter of an enslaved person. My grandfather's grandfather was enslaved. So I think about my four-year-old son sitting on my grandfather's lap. I imagine my grandfather sitting on his grandfather's lap. And I'm reminded that this history we tell ourselves was a long time ago truly wasn't that long ago at all. And so part of what the book is attempting to do is give us a sense of our collective physical proximity to the history of slavery, how the scars of slavery are etched into the landscape all around us. But also what it's trying to do is give us a sense of our temporal proximity to this history, to, to remind us that despite the suggestion that this was a long time ago and has nothing to do with the world we live in today, that in the scope of human history, this was just yesterday. Slavery existed in the British colonies that would become the United States and then the United States for 250 years and has only not existed for a little over 150. So you have an institution that has existed for a century longer than it hasn't, an institution in which there are people alive today who knew, who loved, who were raised by, people who were born into this country as chattel. And so the idea that we would suggest that this history has nothing to do with the contemporary landscape of inequality, this idea that we would suggest that this history is irrelevant to, to our contemporary social, political, and economic infrastructure is revealed to be morally and intellectually disingenuous. And that's not an ideological position, it's an empirical one. It's one based on the evidence in front of us. And so my hope is that, you know, if anything, people leave the book um, thinking about how close we are to this history um, and how this history continues to shape, you know, our, our society in profound, um, profound ways that we have not fully accounted for um, by any means. And so uh, that's a little bit about my project and some of what I've been thinking over, over the last several years. Uh, but I'm going to hand it over to, to Renee Stout and I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing what she has to say. Thank you, Clint. I'm going to talk about this first work, um, this first slide, because this is the work that's included in um, the exhibition, and it's entitled Headstone for Marie Laveau. And this is the perfect piece for me to start with, because first of all, I would like to thank my parents for never having uh, indoctrinated my sister and myself with any kind of organized religion, although they did let us go to to church with our grandmothers, uh, both of our grandmothers on both sides, so that we could experience that. But they left us free to, you know, venture out and try to grasp spirituality for ourselves. They, you know, instilled in us that there was a, a you know, a higher power, although they didn't define that for us, and that we had a connection to the world and to nature. And so that is the basis that I started off in as a child who was interested in art and having seen African spiritual objects at the Carnegie Museum when I was growing up, the curiosity about being an African-American child uh, made me wonder what these objects were about. And so I went down a rabbit hole of discovery and self-discovery, which eventually led me to investigate other ways of understanding African-American belief systems, spiritual belief systems of, of my ancestors. And so when I came to Washington, D.C. and discovered the National Museum of African Art, a whole world was opened up. And during that same time I came to uh, D.C. and experienced that museum, I went to New Orleans and also discovered that in the open, you have these vestiges of African, Amer uh, African belief systems that have uh, basically influenced African-American spirituality, although it was kept hidden because we live in what is deemed a Christian society. And there's that struggle to be our authentic selves under the system that we find ourselves in. And we can see how that is continuing to play out in current, uh, current events right now. So I'm glad that this is the piece that's in the show because it provides the perfect context for the work that I've been doing these past 35 years. This is called Ogun. And once again, it's a continuation of the things that I've discovered as I've been researching African spiritual belief systems. Because in doing so, I am reinventing the narrative myself for my own existence within this context of the United States of America. 
you know, I've always known in my heart that the narrative that has been assigned to us was not really who we were, what our culture was about. And I knew that it was designed to make us feel less than and to keep us in our place. And so the whole idea of what I've been doing is operating in a kind of um, way to subvert that narrative that has been assigned and create the one that I know is more close to who I am as a human being and to help me navigate this place we find ourselves in now. You know, our ancestors fought this whole thing and they had these spiritual belief systems to carry them through. They've been passed down to us if we care to, you know, pay attention. And I am one who has chosen to pay attention. And so this is the foundation of the bodies of work that I've created over several years past. So as I create this work, I imagine that although I am in this, I don't have to be of it. And so I allow my imagination to project me to places where I thrive. So I have a whole parallel universe that I've constructed and a whole narrative that goes along with it and characters, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a character that moves through this. I'm the protagonist, I suppose. And I have, you know, characters that are support people. Uh, there's a whole universe that I've constructed. And so this is and a vision that I have. And this is the way I help the viewer to see what I'm seeing. So this particular piece is about looking at where we are right now in our culture and society and what's going on. And I imagine that we're destroying the planet. We're being divisive to the point where, you know, at some point we're not going to be able to thrive at all. And it's almost like there's this dying planet that I'm envisioning. But then at the same time, in that darkness over to the side, you see on the left, there is a brighter place to be. And that's where I'm projecting myself. And as I do this, I am just, you know, I have all the music I'll need over here. And I work in my studio listening to music. And the music helps to take me to another zone and to feed my soul and my spirit. I draw on that music that I grew up with. The, the music that, you know, just hits me and, and just transports me to a place that helps me to just, you know, rise above or transcend all that's going on. And these authorities that I am witnessing now that govern us currently, I've decided that they are not my authorities. And because I have not internalized the idiocy, it allows me to just navigate it, but not succumb to it. So I have my own set of authorities that, you know, inspire me and keep me going. And this guardian of the gate and master of the game is the kind of trickster that, you know, is not held down by what's going on, but is able to like High John the Conqueror, the legend of High John the Conqueror is able to trick those forces that would keep us oppressed. And the final slide is the soul catcher regenerator, because what I am asking politely is for people to kind of understand that we live in this world together and we're going to have to find a way to do it in a civil way. But if you are not willing to do that, then I may have to help you along with these devices that I create that are there to alter sort of negative energies and turn them into positive ones. And so I will adjust your attitude for you. So this is the way I think as I'm working on, you know, my work and trying to help the viewer understand the narrative that I've been creating for a long time and how it evolves as we evolve and as we experience things such as the pandemic, the George Floyd murder. Um, this is the way I cope. And this is the world that I offer, um, the, um, you know, where I take my imagination to in order to transcend and to keep moving forward and to keep evolving and to keep progressing and to keep thriving. So with that, I will turn it over to Hank Willis Thomas. I'm so happy to be included in this exhibition and invited to participate in this talk. I am especially excited because I, as, as a young person, spent many, many days and years and hours uh, going through this museum, never imagining to see my work there. My relationship to the themes of the exhibition and 
to the theme of the of this talk really kind of begins with the work of my mother, Deborah Willis, who is, as was mentioned, an art historian, and a curator, and a photographer, who has spent most of her career looking at the way in which people of African descent look at one another and the way that representations of Blackness by Black artists, and especially Black photographers, is distinctly different and uh, and more humane than the ways you know, mainstream society typically has. In my work, I've used the archive inspired by my mother to build um, a kind of uh, a methodology and a language of talking about both the past and the present in hopes that it can inform a future. And so I'm going to show an excerpt from a video installation that I did in uh, 2014 called A Person is More Important Than Anything Else. And this piece really was a kind of meditation on the words of, of James Baldwin. James Baldwin, who are you? First of all, I'm speaking as an American citizen. I'm speaking as also as the grandson of a slave. My mother was born in Maryland. My father was born in New Orleans. I was born in New York. Someone who represents a very complex country, which insists on being simple-minded. If I were original, originally from Dakar, or from uh, wherever I was in Africa, I couldn't find out where it was because my entry into America is a bill of sale. And that stops, you know, that stops you from going any further. At some point in, in, the, in our history, I became... Nobody knows my name. Baldwin's nigger. James Baldwin, who are you? Don't you care not to find out? When it rained for days and the skies turned dark at night. There are days, this is one of them, when you wonder. When it rained five days and the skies turned dark as night. What your role is in this country and what your future is in it. A boy last week, he said, I got no country, I got no flag. He's only 16 years old. And I couldn't say you do. We don't even have a country. I know that. Do we have a country? He said, you know, this is your country, which is not your country. What flag going on a black man's flag? You have no flag, brother. Speaking now as though I were your educator, as though I were your teacher, I would beg you to ask me why, for example, your history books are the way they are. When I was growing up, I was taught in American history books, but Africa had no history, and neither did I. But I was a savage. Come back. About whom the less said the better. Who had been saved by Europe. To America. And of course, I believed it. I didn't have much choice. Those are the only books there were. I'm compelled to doubt my history, to examine it. I'm compelled to try to create it. I'm trying to excavate my history from all the rubble that has buried it for so many hundreds of years. And that means I have to question everything. My work is about framing and context and how, depending on where you're standing, it affects what you see. Uh, the notion of my own identity and the notion of blackness that I learned uh, through American culture is a completely fabricated one. Uh, one of the things that I've been attempting to address in my visual art and conceptual art is that um, framing how a story is told and who is telling a story actually um, informs our understanding of reality and the history is often a specific angle. It is likely told by a male and likely told by a Western person of upper class. And I have learned through the work of my mother and so many other historians, and especially in the past 50 years, that it's probably more appropriate to talk about in our story a, a, a vision of the past that's 
informed by a multinodal uh, perspective that it's really the intersection of truths rather than a universal truth that in informs history. And when race is talked about as a fixed fact, we tend to miss uh, the, the other truths uh, that, that come along with any human identity, which is that uh, there is a level of complexity that can never be deduced into um, a simple, definable format. And even in the context of my work that's an exhibition, which is called The Place to Call Home, Africa, America, there are, in this work, I have traveled all over the United States, I've all traveled all over the continent of Africa, and have never felt particularly home in either place. And I realized that, that Africa, America, in quotes, uh, is the place where people in my uh, recent ancestry come from. And it really is a place in our imagination. And so I combined the continent of North America with the continent of Africa to, to kind of present this notion of um, where I come from. Also, uh, to what I've been forced to reconcile with is that African-Americans in the United States are not the largest diasporic population of Africans on the continent of the Americas. And that even our notion of America, when we speak about it, is actually negating the truth of uh, what it means to be an American and even African-American. So I, I have been encouraging myself and others to really complicate our notion of what it means to be Black in America, because what we call America should be also expanded and broadened. And as we have more uh, immigrants coming from Africa and different parts of the Caribbean who have a different perspective and a different relationship to the, the legacy of slavery and colonialism, it actually informs, enhances, and um, complicates, and I think a, a, in a generative way, our notion of Blackness and its not only its, its limitations, but also its infinite possibility. It's been such a pleasure to hear uh, the three of you speak about your work. Um, I really feel honored to be in dialogue with all of you. And as I said, I have a few questions um, and, and um, you likely have questions for each other. So I'm hoping we can have a nice conversation and then open up the floor to questions from our, from our viewers. <clears throat> and I wanna get back to the title of our session today, uh, which is inspired by Clint's book, uh, Blackness, Blackness is not peripheral to the American project. It is, it is the foundation. Um, and I wanted to talk about an important aspect that cuts across all of your work uh, and practice, which deliberately engages the public, sometimes in the public sphere um, or in an interactive and intimate way. And Clint, I'm thinking about your YouTube series, Crash Course in Black American History, and how YouTube has really become a very active site of public engagement in our society uh, today. Um, Hank, a central defining pro uh, aspect of your project for freedoms is commissioning artists to create massive billboards in public space um, where artists can address the public around ideas of civic debate. Um, and Renee, while your work is most often presented in a gallery context, your use of commonplace materials, especially in your installations, like the last slide that you showed us. Um, and you really, you know, bring in sort of these real objects from our daily life, you know, shoes, furniture that, that have this history that really um, brings in viewers into an intimate space and it feels like they and you are speaking to us, you know, uh, directly. Um, so they're you know, very engaging. So I'm, I'm just wondering if we could talk a bit about why is the space of this active engagement you know, with, with the public, with viewers, with readers, why is it so important 
um, to the discussion of the racial legacies of the United States. Like I was saying in my talk that as we try to define ourselves, and that's what I think that we're trying to do and you know, re-examining the narrative that has been told in the United States, you know, I personally, from a personal standpoint, I've decided that, you know, I've just totally discarded the, the, the narrative that has been told and I will, you know, pull the narrative together based on the fragments that I have. And while doing so, I will tell you who I am. You're not going to tell me. And so the thing that I'm trying to do is bring the viewer in to say, hey, look at this. This is the way I've processed this. This is the way I've decided to say, I don't want your narrative. I don't need your narrative. I'm going to tell you who I am. And in that process, hopefully, you know, others will chime in and say, yeah, we're going to tell our own story. So that's why I create the work the way I do. It's inviting a dialogue and inviting people to see things from a different perspective in ways they may not have thought, you know, to do before because we've internalized this idea that we have to accept this narrative when we don't. On my end, you know, part of what I'm interested in is, is expanding our sense of the of what um, educational spaces look like, right? And that education exists beyond the context of the classroom. It exists beyond uh, traditional learning pedagogies, like learning from a textbook. Um, and that's part of why the conceit, the underlying conceit of the book is, is based in place. Because I really believe deeply in the power of, of physical space and, and historical sites and putting your body in the places where history happened as a mechanism of sort of transporting you and giving you a different sense of, of proximity to this history. And I think it's in conversation in some ways with um, Renee's work in this idea of the, <clears throat> like my version, it's my version of the sort of materiality of it, right? Like something about touching the actual fragments um, and using that in one's art, I think is in conversation with the, the idea of like putting your body in the building or on the soil or in the earth where um, these different parts of our history happen. I was just this past week in uh, Manzanar, uh, which is the one of the incarceration camps where Japanese and Japanese Americans were held uh, during World War II. And I had never been to one of these, these camps. It's about three and a half hours north of Los Angeles at the foot of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And it completely transformed my understanding of that period of history in a way that that no you know, book or no, uh, that I imagine nothing else could have done. And so I, I do think that there is um, something about the physical touch, something about your body experiencing the sort of sensory details of a, of a space as it relates to history, um, I think is particularly uh, powerful and part of why in my work, I continue to be drawn to to those spaces um within the context of my work and i have really been trying to find a place to call home as i mentioned and i can just show you now looking at this particular image of the slave ship brooks which i turned into a bottle mimicking the absolute campaigns and stated absolute power is that when i realized that race in the united states or maybe race in general is the most um successful advertising campaign of all time and that we are told that there are different brands of people, so to speak, and that the certain brands have certain value and certain ability. And um, this, whoever is actually doing the marketing is obviously going to do that to benefit themselves. And I've been really interested in trying to kind of uh, encourage myself and others to look at the framework and the narrative so that we can start to find uh, new narratives, make new narratives. And I think at least, and also to inform the ones that we've grown most accustomed to in a way that can lead to a safer society and a more humane one. Thank you so much for your uh, responses. Um, you know, some of you may know that I'm, I'm a scholar of Latinx and Latin American art, um, and that I also have cultural roots in the African diaspora in the Caribbean, um, the Spanish speaking Caribbean. And one of the joys of Afro-Atlantic histories uh, for me is that it brings together the diaspora, right? Um, 
in, in, and it brings the diaspora into conversation. I think that's one of the most powerful aspects of this exhibition. And it's kind of like, you know, when I was writing papers in graduate school, this exhibition sort of does what I was doing in my papers that wasn't happening in museum space, that wasn't happening in many different places. So it really fills my heart with joy to see that conversation. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, you know, we could just talk a little bit about, about the power of that, um, that, you know, obviously the show exposes how, you know, Black people are around the world um, and definitely across the Americas. But, but why is it so important to remember and memorialize that the Black experience is a global experience? For me, you know, that's why I was saying this exhibition have that early peace of mind, which was done in 1990 when I was having this spiritual awakening and symbolically trying to express that by when you look at the piece itself, there are these little tendrils that kind of spiral out. Uh, in, in some ways, it's the spirit of Marie Laveau reaching out to the diaspora. And, you know, the fact that at that time I was beginning, as I read and researched, to realize these spiritual connections with the Caribbean and, you know, we're all over the world. And that is what this exhibition represents. And the idea that living in a city like Washington, DC, that's an international city. So not only was I discovering these African belief systems and how they sort of manifested in African-American culture, but also with a large Latino population and how there's, you know, Santeria shops that are related to these, you know, these so-called root stores that have their basis in the African-American community and making those connections. So I think that that's what's important to me about this exhibition and how I'm so happy that that particular piece lands at that, you know, at this museum where I've done this discovery of the African diaspora right here in an international city like this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that any project, um, artistic or otherwise, that sort of complicates our our uh, understanding and our, I'm saying broadly, America's um, or the world's, not necessarily Black people, um, that complicates this country's understanding of Blackness as homogenous and rather... Um, pushes us to recognize the heterogeneity of, of the Black experience, I think is an important one. And I think that part of what is embodied within that is not only the, the idea that Blackness as a, a culturally is, is pluralistic, right? That it exists in across a myriad of uh, national borders, that it exists across a range of different, um, that it takes on a range of different sort of ethnic permutations. Um, but also that, you know, we're here talking about the, the in part, the history of slavery and, and a sort of history of oppression that Black people have experienced. But I think also what an exhibition like this outlines is the how Blackness is not singularly defined by the violence that it is experienced, right? That Blackness is far more expansive than that, right? That as seriously as it is, as, ser as important as it is, to take seriously the experiences of enslavement, the experiences of Jim Crow, the experiences of all of its different iterations and permutations across the across the world, it is similarly important to recognize that um, the experience of Black Americans and Black people across the diaspora is not defined just by a set of oppression, but is defined by a, a much more robust and expansive set of emotional and social experiences. Um, than, than just that. I believe that there is a difference between Blackness and Africanness. Mm -hmm. And I, there, there was a Black British artist from the 80s who we would probably now refer to as South Asian, who talked about in their political um, moment of his youth, uh, or just in, in, in England specifically, up until more recently, Blackness was more defined as your relationship to power. And that um, our idea that Blackness can only be defined in skin color is something that is limiting to actually the kind of universal oppression that people have felt um, in contrast 
to uh, those who are in power, especially in the relationship to Western society. I also know that uh, blackness as a concept is, while it can be confined, it can also be a gateway into and into liberty, into authentic humanity, into um, out of the colonial uh, uh, mindset. Because I think of Black joy, particularly, which is a global phenomenon, uh, and that we get to celebrate on the continent. More recently, in popular music, we see music from Nigeria and Tanzania and South Africa being more played in, in the United States. But as we know, a lot of our music has been in great dialogue with Afro-Caribbeans and Africans from South America. But Black Joy, to me, is this spirit that has come as a result of these attempts of to oppress and crush uh, humanity, the humanity out of people. And this... I, I think of black joy as the kind of most indestructible form in the universe. And the reason that it's so important that we connect all the dots across the world is to record is because this is the mentality and the spirit that will continue to keep human beings on this planet. Thank you for such beautiful responses. So there's a question here, Clint, please elaborate on how I, as an educator can engage youth about the legacy of slavery and our present day society? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, we're in a moment where there have never been more resources for teachers than there are now um, to teach about this history. Uh, I think the uh, Learning for Justice website, um, Teaching for Change, um, the Zen Education Project, uh, facing history in ourselves, all of those spaces have, have really fantastic and robust resources for educators. They have really great communities for educators, webinars, professional development, virtual professional development sessions. Um, and, you know, there are, I think there are a lot of teachers out there who are trying to figure out what the, the best way to teach this history is in a way that there maybe hasn't been before, um, in, uh, at least in, in my own lifetime. And so, I think really tapping into those is is really important. And then um, Carmen alluded to this before. On my end, I have a YouTube series I host called Crash Course Black American History. Uh, we have 51 episodes we'll be doing about different parts of the Black American experience. Uh, we have gone through I think, 38 of them, uh, so 13 more to go. Um, but it's 10 or 15 minute videos, um, primarily meant for anybody, but uh, meant specifically for educators to use in their classrooms. And it's like an animated version of me um, talking about some of these different parts of history um, from the moment enslaved people arrived on these shores to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement for the past several years. So uh, hopefully that can be a helpful resource as well. But uh, but yeah, I think, you know, just making sure that we recognize that our, our young people are growing up in a really multi in a multimedia age. And I think that we have to find multimedia ways to uh, to engage them. Um, so I would uh, offer that contribution as well as the, the myriad resources available on those, uh, through those different organizations I mentioned. And then I have a question um, for Hank. So uh, this is coming from Kenitra Fletcher, who's the curator of uh, Afro-Atlantic Histories. It says, Hank, I see you actively engaging with the public with the work in the exhibition. What was your thinking behind the surface of a place to call home, making the work reflective after it was opaque black? I wanted to make the work reflective because I wanted people to see themselves in this history, in this imagination, in this imagined world. And um, because it does, uh, operates somewhat like a mirror, but it's not square. It starts to, I think, challenge our notion of kind of the limits of this idea. And, and so it was really, um, I've, I've chosen mirrors and reflective surfaces a lot in my work because it keeps the viewer in recognition of their own kind of agency, their own gaze as connected to the work. 
Thank you. Um, I'm just reading through some messages, some questions here. Let's see, here's one about race in the US. While a civil solution to race relations in the US seems like wishful thinking, countries are ideas that only exist if enough people accept them. Why not shift the conversation toward a post US existence? I'm already there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the more I look at this, it just seems to me like we are at a point where Americans really start to really have to think about the idea is, you know, how long can this be romantically considered the United States? It seems like it's going in any way but that direction to be united. Uh, to the point where certain people's belief, they believe that they, their, their freedoms can impinge upon other people's freedoms and even threaten other people's lives, their choices. They feel like their choices should be able to threaten other people's lives. And at what point do we decide that we have to find an amicable way to make this the two countries that they're shaping up, that it's shaping up to be. And, you know, I keep going back to the idea that there is a reason that there was a North and South Korea, and there is a reason that there was once an East and West Germany. And I think that at some point in time, we're really going to have to seriously consider what it means to stay together as this, this country that seems to be falling apart, or how are we going to, you know, each you know, go the I, these two ideologies go our separate ways so that they can thrive the way they need to and we can thrive the way we need to. So that's where I'm at right now. And, you know, when I say that people glaze over or, you know, feel like it's impossible, but um, I don't think it's impossible. I just feel like we need to seriously consider ways that will allow us to thrive. Those of us who want a just society, an equitable society, um, you know, to consider the health and well-being of all of its citizens, we need to find out how we can have a society like that and just let the dead weight go where they want to go. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have, uh, I think we only have like two minutes left, so we don't have enough time to talk about the, the artificial construction of borders as a mechanism of violence. But, um, you know, I, I think that we are in a moment um, where we have to take seriously um, that there are fissures in our country um, and chasms in our country that are growing. Um, and and there, it's too early to say, it's, too, I, I, it's hard to say what, you know, if, uh, whether they continue to grow or whether something happens, some, massive event happens, typically a massive event happens in history. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, a pandemic or a war or a, uh, another sort of natural or man-made disaster that uh, that sort of re recalibrates the the nature of, of how the country, the direction of where the country is going. Um, I think many people thought the pandemic would be that in one way and it ended up being that in another way. Um, if anything, it's exacerbated some yeah. of the, the divisions that we have. So I don't know. I think, you know, I'd always try to move with humility, humility and curiosity because I, I think making predictions is, uh, you'll tip, you'll usually be wrong, but, um, <laughs> but I just, you know, I, history is messy and chaotic. Um, and oftentimes we don't know until we're there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's an, and, uh, it is an unsettling moment in our country in, in many ways. Um, but I, as I kind of said before, I try to, as unsettling as it is, um, and as difficult as so many things are in the world right now, I also think there's a lot of remarkable stuff happening, you know, in terms, in art, in culture, in our society. Um, and I think making sure that, you know, I try to do a sort of both and approach, um, as much as possible, because otherwise, you know, you get kind of paralyzed and overwhelmed by uh, by everything else. And there's a story in the Bible in the parable of the builder. You know, the house built on a weak foundation can't will not stand a storm. And the foundation of this 
a house or this country is it was slavery was uh rape murder and uh genocide and until we truly address the uh the the foundation the weakness in our foundation this w- will always be a fragile mm-hmm. house i am in the house <laughs> so i have uh some vested interest in making sure that it doesn't collapse on me and to that degree i am invested in, uh, in upholding it or at least finding ways to rebuild it while it does not collapse on top of me. And as artists, part of our responsibility to society is to dream the things that what others are either afraid to, uh, to, to, to make them real and to put them out into the world so that we can address them. And so that's a part of what I am attempting to do in this moment. Thank you all so much for your wonderful comments, for really creating your work and sharing it with us um, in the exhibition and through this program. It's really been an honor to be in conversation with all of you um, and to be able to, you know, relate your work to the mission of the National Gallery, which is to reflect and attract the nation and and to engage the nation in a conversation about who we are, about our history, and about our common humanity. So it's really um, a pleasure to be in touch with all of you and to present your work to our our visitors. Um, This has been a wonderful conversation. I want to thank um, our education and public program staff for making it possible uh, and for our IT staff also for making it look seamless and easy. And we all know that it's not. Um, So thank them, you know, thank you all very much for for making this event possible. And I wanted to remind our viewers that Afro-Atlantic Histories is on view at the National Gallery of Art and will be on view through July 17th. So if you haven't seen it, please uh, make sure to do so and visit our website to learn more about other programs that will be taking place in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you so much for being part of this symposium uh, for today and the last couple of days. It's really been a pleasure to share this time with all of you.